Well, hi there. Happy Shark Week. Shark Week, when I was a child, was one of my favorite weeks of the year. I lived for animal documentaries. And it's hard to say that there is an animal more incredible anywhere on Earth than sharks. But I can say, over the years, Shark Week has become less and less about learning about sharks and more about sensationalized stories of shark attacks. That might be what sells, but it isn't what I came for. Add to that the fact that I haven't had cable in my adult life, and the joy of Shark Week is not something I have experienced in a very, very long time. That is, until today. Let's see if we can teach you more about sharks in one video than you get from an entire week of shark shows on TV. Do you think it can be done? How about this? If you think we pull this off, can I ask you to like this video and subscribe to this channel? All right, let's do this thing. Let's begin with a quick overview of shark anatomy. This is a shark. Sharks, like all members of the chondrichthys, possess a cartilaginous skeleton. Sharks can be differentiated from the other members of the chondrichthys, the rays, including sawfishes and skates, and the chimeras, mostly by looking at their gills. If you look at something like this, or this, or this, or this, or this, or even this, it can be difficult to determine if what you're looking at is a shark or not, until you get a good look at the gills. Sharks have their gills on the side of their body, not the bottom like rays. So that alone can tell you that this and this are not sharks. They will also have five to seven exposed gill slits. You can see them. They aren't covered with an operculum, as is the case with bony fish, including this guy, which is secondarily cartilaginous. Secondarily cartilaginous, meaning that it has a cartilaginous skeleton, but it evolved from ancestors with bones. The same is almost certainly true for the sharks and the rest of the chondrichthys as well, including this guy, which is part of the chondrichthys, has its gills on the side of its head, but unlike the sharks, has an operculum. It also reveals that this guy and this guy are sharks. The basic body plan of a shark is fairly typical for a non-tetrapod fish. In general, sharks have two dorsal fins, a primary and a secondary on top. A caudal fin at the end, which may have two lobes of roughly equal size, homocircle, like we see in mako sharks, or with one lobe longer than the other, heterocircle, like we see in thresher sharks. On the bottom, we generally see two sets of paired fins. What the heck? SeaWorld has put three pairs of paired fins. I don't think that ever happens. Okay, garbage, SeaWorld. Okay, on the bottom, we generally see two sets of paired fins. You hearing me, SeaWorld? Two sets of paired fins. The pectoral and the pelvic fin with a single anal fin, not, not a second set of pelvic fins. Come on. Not, not to mention, this claims, SeaWorld claims this is a great white shark, but this is a paint scheme for a Mako. Great white shark, harsh cut off. What? How do you do this to me, SeaWorld? How do you do? Okay. Two sets of paired fins, pectoral, pelvic, single anal fin. Sharks have internal fertilization, meaning that they need to transfer sperm inside of the body cavity of the female. This is achieved using paired structures coming from the pelvic fins called claspers. Claspers like this are also present in rays, so you still need to look at the gills if you see them. This guy has a clasper on his head. That's right, he transfers sperm using an organ on his face. It's called a cephalic clasper. Cephalic meaning head. The word cephalization has to do with the fact that sense organs tend to be clustered on the head. And the fact that these guys have not only their sense organs, but their clasper as well on their heads has always helped me to remember 
the subclass to which chimeras belong, holocephali, meaning complete head. Mm, I'll say. But let's talk about the heads of sharks for a second. They're amazing, even if uh, a bit incomplete. Not a clasper to be seen. Probably the most notorious feature of the shark head is that mouth. Though I do wonder if that would still be true if they had a face clasper. Anyway, that mouth is well known for its teeth. These teeth may be small or large, needle-like, blade-like, flat or completely non-functional, and everything in between. The largest on record belonged to the whale-eating shark Megalodon. And sharks are well known for possessing rows upon rows of these teeth. And the reason for the rows isn't to have multiple sets with which to bite, at least generally, but rather because the individual teeth are rather short-lived, about two weeks on average. And therefore, they're in a constant cycle of replacement. Some sharks may go through 35,000 or more teeth in a lifetime. The teeth, which are actually modified scales, form down by the jaw and then rotate into position like a conveyor belt of death. And these teeth, interestingly enough, are not rooted into the jaw, and the jaws are not fused to the skull. They are a completely separate piece. And the lack of attachment allows them to protrude forward, an ability that is most pronounced in the goblin shark, but present in most, if not all, sharks. But the lack of attachment doesn't seem to come at the expense of jaw force. The great white shark is estimated to have the greatest bite force of any animal alive today at 4,000 PSI. You'll notice, if you ever get a good look into a shark's jaws, that you can see the gill slits, and in some cases, you can see right back out into the ocean through the gill slits. This is because sharks respire by taking water into the mouth and expelling it over the gills and then out through the gill slits. Now, unlike the gill slits, which are on the side, the mouth is generally on the bottom of the shark, which means that taking water in through the mouth can be a problem when a shark is sitting on the seafloor. Sharks that tend to do this generally have a second water intake called a spiracle located right behind the eye. And speaking of that eye, sharks have very good vision. The basic structure of the eye is remarkably similar to the human eye. But one big difference is the presence of a reflective layer called a tapetum lucidum that reflects light and allows greater vision in very low light conditions. If you've ever seen an animal's eyes glow when a light is pointed their way, that's why. They've got a tapetum lucidum. Many sharks have a movable, protective covering for their eye called a nictitating membrane. Though, as we discovered in our video about the white sharks and their relatives, not all of them do. And despite the fact that they have great vision, that probably isn't their most impressive sense. Sharks have a notoriously great sense of smell. Though the exact sensitivity has likely been greatly overestimated in the past, it's still quite great. The nostrils are located on the ventral side of the rostrum. Unlike our nostrils, they do not connect to the mouth or throat of the shark. They're a blind sac, like our lungs, which uh, they don't have at all. I'll get to that in a second. But this means that they can't sneeze, in case you were wondering about shark sneezes. If they get something in their nose, they have to do a little Taylor Swift impersonation. <laughs> Before I get to that utter lack of lungs, I want to talk about the other holes you might have noticed in that rostrum. Those smaller holes are called ampullae de Lorenzini and are primarily electrosensitive, though they also detect geomagnetism and possibly temperature as well. But why is the ability to detect electricity important for a shark? Well, because electricity is released every time you do things like move your muscles and beat your heart, which is a muscle, so anytime you move your muscles. And if you're doing any of these things in close proximity to a shark, it's gonna know about it, even if you're buried under the substrate. So let's talk for just a moment about those lungs before we dive into all eight extant orders of sharks. So lungs, they, they don't have any. And that might not seem too revolutionary, but 
it is. Because most fish either have lungs or at least a very similar structure called a swim bladder. This structure allows fish to regulate their buoyancy and achieve neutral buoyancy where they neither sink nor float and they can just remain suspended effortlessly in the water column. Sharks cannot do this. They have a huge fatty liver which reduces their density but in the end they are still heavier than water and sink unless energy is used to keep them up. Some sharks can sink to the bottom and breathe through their spiracles, but some are obligate ram ventilators, meaning that they need flow from swimming to get enough water over the gills to survive. Others live in the open ocean, where sinking to the bottom is not a survivable option, and all of them need to get off of the bottom from time to time. And they get off of the ground just like we do, with a combination of thrust, which they get from the caudal fin instead of a propeller, and lift from the pectoral and pelvic fins, which are effectively wings. And that is how sharks get off of the ground. And let's just take a moment to let that sink in. Is that pun intentional? I don't think it was, but here we are. Anyway, I think we've probably already covered more information about sharks than Shark Week, but we haven't even arrived at the main event just yet. So take a couple of deep breaths. In through your not blind sack nostrils, into your blind sack lungs, which sharks do not have at all. And then blow it out past your single row of non-replaceable teeth that are fused into your jawbone, which is not made of cartilage. And speaking of bone, that's one more thing we probably should talk about before we get to the main event. Bones. Sharks don't have them. You probably already put that together, but they do have blood. And that might seem like a non sequitur, but blood and bones in vertebrates are often intimately related. Because blood is generally made in the bone marrow, which sharks do not have. Are you starting to see the problem? Well, it turns out that blood is principally made in the spleen of sharks, but also in a special organ found in most sharks near the esophagus called the Leydig organ. And another organ near the gonads called the epigonal organ. It just goes to show that when God closes a door, he gives you a blood generating organ near your gonads. But not a face clasper. In fact, if you have a face clasper, you don't get a Leydig or an epigonal organ. And you still don't have bones. But you do get to be the most cephalized animal I know to exist, and that's certainly worth something. Okay. Now we're ready for the main event. All eight shark orders and how they're related to one another. And I've got to tell you, some of them are super weird. So buckle up. Sharks, along with the rays, including skates and sawfishes, fall into the subclass Elasmobranchii. Let me know if you would like to see a video like this about the rays as well. The sharks comprise the clade Selachimorpha, which itself is divided into two major clades, Galeomorphii and Squalomorphii. The vast majority of all of the sharks you have ever seen before fall into the Galeomorphii, with the Squalomorphii being made up mostly of sharks that are weird as heck. Now there is some considerable debate about exactly which sharks belong where. This is compounded by the fact that cartilaginous fishes don't fossilize super well, so the fossil record is not as informative as it is in many other groups. So some of what we're about to talk about may change as we collect more evidence. But generally, sharks are broken up into eight orders, with four in the Galeomorphii and four in the Squalomorphii. Galeomorphii, meaning helmet form sharks, for reasons that I can't seem to figure out, but I would love to know if any of you have any insight, is the group with the most recognizable and iconic sharks. They're frequently referred to, at least within the ranks of shark nerds, as Galea or Galean sharks. The most distantly related group, to the point that some phylogenies place them in the Squalomorphii, are the nine species of bullhead, Port Jackson and horn sharks in the order Heterodontiformes, meaning different tooth form. These are pretty small, with the largest members of the clade growing no larger than about 1.65 meters or five and a half feet. They're very distinctive looking, that head in particular. The mouth is entirely in front of the eye, near the front of the head. This means that they have a very short rostrum. Their jaws have a very unusual shape as they kind of 
bow forward at the front. Their teeth are indeed different and are more for crushing and grinding than what you find in most sharks. Their nostrils look a bit like the L'Oreal pits of pit vipers, except surrounded with thick nostril lips and with grooves leading back into the mouth. They also have ridges over their eyes like a dinosaur. Their eyes lack a nictitating membrane, so they are unprotected, but they have spines coming from both of their dorsal fins, hence the name horn shark, so uh, that makes up for a lot. Not too shabby. The next most distantly related group within the Galeomorphii are the more than 40 species of carpet sharks in the order Orectolobiformes, the long lobe form sharks. This group includes some of the raddest and the absolute largest of all living sharks. Their mouth is in a similar position to that of the bullhead sharks, but they lack the spines, eyebrow ridges, and the fleshy nostril lips, though they do still have the grooves known as nasoral grooves that connect the nose to the mouth. Next to the nostrils, they often possess little sensory barbels. They tend to have five gill slits, with the fourth and fifth being so close to one another that they almost overlap. This group of sharks includes some that you're fairly likely to see in aquariums and on dives as they're impressive and simultaneously unlikely to pose any danger to humans. These include sharks like nurse sharks, zebra sharks, wobegongs, and one of my favorite of all animals, whale sharks, which are the largest non-tetrapod fish in the world. If you want to know what the largest fish of all is, you should check out our video on whales. But the largest whale shark on record was 18.8 meters, 61.7 feet long. They may get longer than that. I made a special trip to the Georgia Aquarium just so I could see whale sharks. And someday, I hope to see them in the wild. If you want to see this happen, please consider supporting us on Patreon. The final two orders in the Galeomorphii are probably the most recognizable and feared groups of sharks of them all. The Carcariniformes and the only order we have already covered in its entirety on this channel, the Lamniformes. The Carcariniformes contains some of the most iconic and feared sharks in the ocean, such as bull sharks and tiger sharks, as well as sharks like hammerheads, reef sharks, cat sharks, as well as many others. Heck, the word Carcariniformes means shark-shaped. So these are the shark-shaped sharks. And fair enough, this is the largest single order of sharks. They are together known as the ground sharks. Like all of the sharks we've examined so far, they have five gill slits and a full array of fins, but not this, not this many fins. These guys have their mouths behind their eyes, like most sharks, but unlike the groups we've examined so far. They also have a nictitating membrane, a clear movable covering for the eye, and that will help you distinguish them from the last order of Galean sharks, the mackerel sharks of the order Lamniformes. The Lamniformes basically fit the description of their closest relatives, the Carcariniformes, in every way except for the lack of a nictitating membrane. This includes some of the raddest of all sharks, such as great white sharks, the basking shark, which is the second largest extant non-tetrapod fish, makos and sand tigers, as well as more obscure and weird sharks like megamouth sharks, thresher sharks, and goblin sharks. Again, if you want to know more about them, we have an entire video about the Lamniformes, and it, um, it totally rocks. If you want full videos about any of the other shark groups, please let me know which one's in the comments. But that brings us to the Squalomorphii, which, as I said earlier, are just weird as heck. There are some weird Galean sharks, don't get me wrong, but the Squalomorphii, also known as the Squalia or Squalian sharks, I think because their livers are high in squalene, they really take the cake. Goblin sharks, hammerheads, and megamouth sharks are pretty weird, don't get me wrong, but, uh, well, squalian sharks can be quickly identified by their lack of the anal fin. Though the loss of the anal fin seems to have happened a bit later in the evolution of squalian sharks, as the most distantly related order, the hexanchiformes, have one. But that doesn't make them normal looking sharks. Not at all. Nor does it mean that they have all of their fins, because they don't. They only have one dorsal fin and it is located back behind the pelvic fins. 
So way back on the body. And their caudal fin is also super weird. Their vertebrae extend into the dorsal lobe of the fin. And the ventral lobe is either small or missing entirely, so they basically have snake tails. They make up for these lost fins by having six or seven gill slits, and some of the freakiest looking teeth that you are ever going to see with all kinds of points. The two families, the cow sharks and the frilled sharks, are not only weird generally, but they are so different from one another that they are sometimes considered to be different orders altogether. The next most distantly related member of the Squalomorphii is a little less alien looking. In fact, instead of looking like some sort of unholy demon, apparently this group, the Squatiniformes, appears most angelic indeed. I don't know how angelic these angel sharks really are, but they are flat, as their name, Squatiniformes, would suggest. So all that talk about how to distinguish sharks and rays is uh, really coming in handy right about now. They don't look too crazy compared to the other Squalian sharks that we've seen so far, but don't let their names and their aesthetically pleasing appearance fool you. They're quite strange for sharks. As will be the case with all squalian sharks from this point on, these guys are missing their anal fins. And they have both dorsal fins, but both are way back, back behind the pelvic fins. The caudal fin may not have turned into a snake tail, but the ventral lobe, the bottom lobe, is longer than the dorsal lobe, the top lobe. I don't know of any other sharks like that. And again, they are flat, and they tend to bury themselves on the ocean floor like this, and then pop out all freaky-like. And that brings us to the last two orders of extant sharks, the Squaliformes and the Pristioforiformes. Have we earned that like and sub yet? If not, something about these last two orders better put it over the top. Well, good news, the next group glows in the dark. At least some of them do. In many ways, the members of the order Squaliformes look just too normal for the Squalomorphii. But they are missing an anal fin, and some have more than the typical five gill slits possessed by most sharks. Most also have spines in one or both of their dorsal fins. And even though dogfish look pretty normal, other members like the gulper sharks, the sleeper sharks, and the rough sharks are certifiably weird. Not to mention the cookie cutter sharks and the lantern sharks bioluminesce. So uh, that has to count for something. The closest relatives to the squaliformes are the last order of sharks alive today, the pristioforiformes, the saw sharks. And I'm not talking about the sawfish, which aren't sharks, but the actual saw sharks, which are somehow even weirder. Possibly because of that Fu Manchu mustache that they've got going on. Now you already know how to distinguish a sawfish from a saw shark. And the barbels and the saw face should be a strong giveaway which shark this is. It does, as is typical of squealing sharks, lack an anal fin. Some have six gill slits, though five is normal for most species. But again, once you have identified this as a shark and not a ray, you're not going to confuse it with any other shark because of its saw and barbels. Now ask me, what does it do with those things? We don't know. The barbels are probably sensory. The saw is probably for hitting prey and or predators. But the reality is that despite how cool sharks are and how much we know about them, there is so much more to learn about sharks than what we already know. So there is no way that this will be our last video about sharks on this channel. But hopefully this one video has taught you more about sharks than a whole shark week. And if so, like and subscribe and we hope to see you real soon. And don't miss our other shark content, like whether or not a black tip reef shark makes a good pet. I mean, obviously they do, if you're a Bond villain. I know, like, I feel like I'm being hard on Shark Week, and I am, but it has to know, like, I used to love you. Come back to us. Ah, uh, you can fix your hair while I'm breathing. Oh my goodness. <laughs> 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 wow. Good. Ow, ow, ow. That was something. Good. Big fleshy nostril Dude. lips. Like they seem like they could give you a big nostril smooch. Yeah. Like smooching that nostril would be satisfying. What? <laughs> would it be? Would I would you, think. Would it be satisfying to you? I would think. Maybe to you.